tip as well as some of other our, our other sponsors. Well, now it brings us up to our, our last presentation of the, of the evening. Um, I don't know, Dr. Lamb, if you've ever finished up the program on a Friday night before, but uh, we certainly might have saved the best for last. Dr. Cliff Lamb is a professor and head of the Department of Animal Science at Texas A&M University. Dr. Lamb is probably known to most of the people in the program or uh, in the room and has been with the Beef Reproductive Task Force, well, since the beginning, over 20 years ago. So uh, he's had numerous awards and recognitions, and we won't have time to go through all of all the things Dr. Lamb has accomplished. But uh, with that, we're really happy to have him on the program talking about a topic that all of us have dealt with, overcoming compliance issues to ensure success of a time AI project and some of the, I'm sure he has seen plenty of wrecks in his time. So with that, Dr. Lamb, we appreciate you, your time in the program and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks a lot, Lee. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, well, thanks. And, and I certainly appreciate it, yes. I. I um, I can't say that I have spoken at 7.15 on a Friday night, so I'm either keeping folks from their weekend or, or from a drink or something like that, but I do appreciate the opportunity to um, chat to everybody and talk a little bit about compliance issues. I also want to, before I really get started, is thank everybody who has spoken and who has attended. Um, uh, the, the topic is very timely, and I think there are a lot of opportunities uh, that, that we can all learn together as we continue to grow the industry and grow, grow uh, the um, adoption of reproductive technologies. So I do appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough over, over a period of uh, 25 to 30 years to be able to uh, interact with a lot of livestock producers, a lot of veterinarians and industry folks. And for the most part, I've tried to log a lot of those uh, interactions. And, and so my presentation is basically going to sort of encompass um, a summary of some of the things that I, I've encountered over the last 30 years as key points in terms of compliance, sort of focusing on um, productivity or uh, reproductive efficiency in, in AI systems. And so, um, I, I, some of the slides that I will have will just be good resources in terms of uh, uh, coming back and using them as resources in the future. And so hopefully you'll be able to access them also uh, if you need them for something in the future. So, you know, the, the one thing that I think we all know is that pregnancy has a, about a four to six times greater economic impact than any other production trait that, that there is out there. And when you take a look at all of the presentations that we have listened to over the last three days, the importance of getting cattle pregnant and getting them pregnant early in the breeding season is paramount to uh, uh, reproductively sound um, beef cattle operation. And so probably one of the most important benchmarks in any beef cattle operation uh, that you can measure, and, and Vitor just talked a little bit about uh, key performance indicators, to me, this would be one of the primary key performance indicators that you can look for is the percentage of cows calving early in the calving season. And when we look at all the, the um, uh, farm business management uh, op, um, groups that have tried to collect data over the, over the last 20 to 30 years, those herds that have a greater percentage of cows calving in the first 30 days of the calving season are the most economically feasible operations out there. And so anything that we can do to, to bunch up the calving season to get a greater percentage of cows calving early in the calving season will have a, a, an impact on our um, overall bottom line. And obviously the utilization of estrus synchronization and fixed timed artificial insemination is one of those tools. It's, uh, it isn't just an, uh, an opportunity to, to gain uh, genetic merit from the offspring, but it's a reproductive management tool to stimulate non-cycling cows to get them to cycle and become pregnant sooner in the breeding season. 
And so when you think of uh, the equation of reproduction and coming back to this compliance issue, there's at least four different areas that, you know, that uh, are part of this equation of reproduction. Obviously, the percentage of females that respond to estrus synchronization is really important or the efficiency or the ability of the person doing the artificial insemination, the fertility of the herd. I mean, how fertile is that herd in general? And then the fertility of the semen that you actually insert into the cow. And so if we took all of those and every single one of them was spot on, I mean, uh, we had uh, really 100% uh, of the females responded to estrus synchronization. The AI tech did his job to the best of his ability. Um, the fertility of the herd was phenomenal. Everything was cycling and they could all get pregnant. And then the fertility of the semen was perfect. We'd have 100% pregnancy rates, but that just, isn't, uh, that just isn't feasible. And it's not something that we can do time in and time out. So let's say we started um, uh, addressing each of those things individually. We have 80% of the females respond to the uh, sync system. The AI tech is about 90% on his game. Uh, the herd uh, fertility is about 80%. And the fertility of the semen is about 90% uh, or 90% viable. You multiply all of those factors together and you get to about a 52% pregnancy rate. And that's just an example of how so many factors from a compliance standpoint sort of points towards us ending up with realistic pregnancy rates of somewhere around 50% pregnancy rates because there are so many factors that play into our overall pregnancy rates. So where do errors in compliance occur? Um, well, I think that one, uh, one thing that often happens is when we get poor pregnancy rates, the first thing that people blame is either the synchronization system, the semen, the, or the artificial insemination technician but for the most part, one of the really important things is the fertility of the herd. And most of that comes in terms of compliance prior to uh, even synchronizing cattle. So it's being prepared for the timed artificial insemination, having a good herd health program, having a good nutrition program, uh, purchasing semen, um, making sure that your nitrogen tank is working or that you have one that is, is viable. Um, there's compliance issues that occur around the time of estrus synchronization, administering the products at the right time or, or the right type of products at the right time, and then animal handling. And, and uh, Vitor talked a little bit about uh, stress and, and temperament. There's also compliance issues that occur around the time of timed artificial insemination, the AI technique or semen handling. And then there are items that we might do post AI from a compliance standpoint that have an impact on embryo survival after fertilization. And so I'm gonna try and touch on uh, different factors in each of these sort of uh, stages from a compliance standpoint. But the thing that I, I think is really important is if you take a, all of the presentations that have uh, come together over the last three days, a lot of those have addressed these in some, some way or another. And my hope is that after this presentation, there might just be one or two things that you might take away from this and say, oh, that, that's something good to know. So let's focus first on before timed artificial insemination. To me, this is the area that probably has the biggest impact on pregnancy rates and, and embryo survival post AI. But I'm not gonna be able to talk about everything. I'm not gonna have the time. I'll just talk a couple of, uh, about a couple of little things just to share with you some, some areas of compliance. And that uh, one of those areas is in pre-reading nutritional management. And so, you know, a couple of folks, I know that uh, Lee talked about body condition score yesterday. I know Vitor's talked about it today. Um, body condition score is extremely important and absolute condition at the time of AI is important, but also change in body condition score. So all those animals, um, going increasing in body condition score approaching the breeding season, or are they losing body condition score approaching the breeding season? So those play into, um, uh, into our compliance issues also. So what we did is we did an experiment where we actually looked at change in body condition score and whether an animal actually has a memory for being well-conditioned or moderately conditioned and the impact of that on subsequent um, cyclicity status, status in heifers. 
And so what we did in this, this experiment is we took heifers and we, uh, we fed half of the heifers to get them to a moderate body condition score, a body condition score of five. And then uh, the other half of the heifers, we actually fed them to get them to a condition score seven. So we got them fairly fat. And this is, uh, uh, this is quite timely, especially for those heifers that are developed in feedlots or developed in dry lot uh, situations. Very often we get them over conditioned. And so that's what we tried to mimic in, the, in this experiment. So we kept those heifers at either a five or a seven, and we call them moderate or fat. And then we started to reduce the feed significantly. So we would take, a, uh, we would feed them at about 70% of their uh, maintenance requirements. So they would lose body condition score. And we took blood samples from these heifers uh, three days a week to see when they would stop cycling. And then, uh, so we determined when they would stop cycling. And then once they stopped cycling, we actually started feeding them uh, at 100% of maintenance again to allow them to start um, increasing in condition again. And we wanted to see at what point they resumed their estrus cycles again. So when you take a look at, at this, um, this table, you'll see those heifers started out at, at uh, the initial body condition score at a condition score five or a seven. But what actually happened is when you look down there, you'll see a body condition score at, at an estrus. They both got down to about a body condition score three before they stopped cycling. The difference was that those heifers that were fat took a lot longer. It took them about 90 days longer to stop cycling. But we would have expected all of that. That's nothing novel or new. The thing that really uh, surprised us though is if you, so once we started feeding these heifers again and asked them to increase in body condition score, you'll take a look at the body condition score when they started cycling again. If they originally started out as moderate as body condition score fives, they went back to a five before they started cycling. If those heifers were fat when, they, when we started starving them, they had to get back up to a body condition score six before they started cycling. And so I think very often what happens when we're managing heifers, we have to be very diligent about these animals in terms of managing their body condition score, because there is some nutritional memory associated with their fertility. And so like these fat heifers, they were more comfortable being fat before they reinitiated their estrus cycles. And so just something to keep in mind and so in terms of approaching the breeding season, these animals need to be, approach, uh, be on an increasing plane of nutrition to actually uh, start cycling sooner and have a, have a greater opportunity to become pregnant to AI. Another example uh, that I wanna talk about pre-breeding um, uh, pre is animal handling and subsequent fertility. Very often we don't really think about this as being all that important, but Vitor very briefly touched on temperament at around the time of animal handling. So this is an experiment that Ronaldo Cook did uh, when he was at the University of Florida as a graduate student. And what uh, he did is he took uh, heifers, half the heifers he would run to the, um, to the chutes, which was about a, a one mile uh, distance. He would take them there 12 times over about a month period of time, just before the start of the breeding season. And then the other half of the heifers, and he would get them used to the uh, cattle handling faci facility, calm them down, get them used to people, and just calm those heifers down. And then the other half of the heifers, he didn't bring out of the pastures at all. And so when they came through the chute, they'd basically be handled by people, they would, be, they would get used to people. And these were um, uh, Boss Indicus cross heifers, so slightly more temperamental. But when you take a look at their cyclicity, when they attained puberty, those animals that became acclimated to people, became acclimated to animal handling, you'll notice that they attained puberty sooner than those animals that were more temperamental, that weren't handled, that weren't uh, calmed down at all. And that then relates to you know, when they became pregnant during the breeding season. Those animals that were in the acclimated group, uh, they started cycling sooner, they hit puberty sooner, and they became pregnant sooner during the breeding season. And one of the key points to artificial insemination or synchronization is those heifers that are cycling will generally have greater pregnancy rates to AI than if they're not cycling. So 
Uh, what Ronaldo did is he moved to Oregon and then he started working with a group of uh, heifers that were Hereford Angus crosses, these black baldy types, to see if they would do the same thing. He ran them through the chute multiple times and just to calm them down again. And so when you take a look at these animals, again, those, those animals that were acclimated before the start of the breeding season, a greater percentage of them started cycling compared to those that were not acclimated. And so the take home message here isn't that you need to run animals through the chute 12 times or 15 times before you start the breeding season. But what, what is a wise idea is to make sure that you're handling those animals or you're feeding them or they, you're making them uh, calm down in as many ways as possible because that will help them attain puberty a little bit sooner. So that's just one area that I talk about. The, some of the other things that need to be taken into account is making sure that semen is ordered in time. I, I think that we deal with, uh, when we speak to producers, uh, some of the horror stories associated with uh, producers who don't order semen on time and then they're rushing and that semen uh, ends up getting messed up somewhere along the way. That, that's really important. And then making sure that the nitrogen tank is still working is holding nitrogen, and, and if it isn't, making sure that a new tank is purchased. So let's focus then at this period of time during estrus synchronization, making sure that you have the correct products, the timing, the animal handling, all of those things are done correctly. So I generated this table, and, and again, it'll be available on this presentation, but it, on the left-hand side, you'll see those um, shaded uh, cells. There are three basic types of products that we use in estrus synchronization. One of the progesterone or progestin-like products. Then the second one of the prostaglandin or PGF product, products. And then gonadotropin releasing hormone or GnRH products down there at the, at the bottom left. So um, obviously the biological action there is in the, in the second column. And then you'll see the product name. And I think this is where a lot of people get uh, somewhat confused when it comes to administering these products, making sure that the product name is known for what the, what the hormone is or what the action is supposed to be. And then the actual dose, the, obviously if we take a look at prostaglandin products, there are different doses. So making sure we're utilizing the right dose for the right product. And then the route of administration, I mean, feeding MGA in the feed, um, using obviously using a cedar as a vaginal implant, but then these other um, uh, products that we actually inject, um, you can either inject some of them, or most of them you, have, you can inject intramuscularly, but, uh, but a product here like Ludolize High Con can be injected subcutaneously. And so just making sure that you, you utilize the, uh, the, the product correctly, utilizing um, one and a half inch needles, 18 gauge uh, um, needles, those types of things are really important from a compliance standpoint. If it says in the muscle, make sure you put it in the muscle. The thing that I do wanna point out here from a BQA standpoint, injecting these products in the neck is no different than injecting them in the hip or in the thigh. And so almost every time we inject these products, we will inject them in the neck because it's a BQA compliance thing. There's no evidence that they're better, uh, they operate better in other parts, in other muscles in the body. So this table also has then storage instructions and making sure that those products are stored in the right um, uh, temperatures based on uh, the, the label that you can find in the product. So just, just keep an eye on those. But that's all really important when it comes to utilizing these products. We often get a lot of questions about uh, one product versus another. And so this is an experiment that Jeff Stevenson and, and I did uh, several years ago, uh, taking a look at the use of estromate versus lutealyze. And this was done in dairy, uh, dairy cows in about 12 or 1300 cows. So they were synchronized using the off sync uh, system. And um, uh, uh, basically, those cows either received estromate or lutealize uh, uh, three days before artificial insemination. And when you take a look down there in the bottom row there, there's no difference in pregnancy rates between estro estromate and lutealize. And I understand the different arguments for the different uh, products. I mean, 
Lutalize, we use five cc's. Estromate, you use two cc's. Estromate has a longer half life than, uh, uh, sorry, est Estromate has a longer half life than Lutalize. What, whoever wants to sell you the products is going to tell you the things that are trigger you to purchase one product over another. But there is no data to show that these products are, are, are better, or one is better than another. Just make sure that you use the products according to the label, uh, just like I showed in the previous, uh, previous uh, slides. Probably one of the thing that uh, one of the things that I've noticed the most in terms of compliant, uh, compliance issues, I've uh, recorded uh, tons of con consultations and I went back and looked at this in terms of uh, consultations associated with the synchronization system itself. In over 1400 of those consultations since 2006, 176 uh, of those were associated with the incorrect product being given at the wrong time. So for example, in the seven day co-sync placida protocol, um, we normally give an injection of GnRH up front, but uh, animals have been uh, receiving um, prostaglandin. And so the question comes, well, what do you do at that point? The same goes uh, for um, herds that end up giving GnRH when they remove the cedar. Well, what is the option there? What do you do at that point? And then if you give uh, GnRH at the time of AI, what are, what is the, what are the, uh, if you give prostaglandin at the time of time AI, what are the options that you, you have going on there? So let me walk through some of these options. And so, you know, if you end up giving a prostaglandin injection uh, when you should have given a GnRH injection at the front part of the protocol, really what I do is, I, and we've been proposing this since 2006, very, uh, so this has been utilized uh, for about 15 to 20 years now, is that if you happen to give a prostaglandin injection um, when you should have given a GnRH injection up front, you can turn that protocol into that seven and seven protocol where you actually give an injection of GnRH um, when, when you would have removed the cedar and essentially start that protocol over and you have the seven and seven protocol now, which works uh, just as well as the uh, uh, seven day co sync cedar protocol. And in some cases it'll work better. And so um, we found that over the last 15 to 20 years, we've seen um, that people have been very satisfied with that solution. The only drawback is that it is added an extra week to the, uh, to the synchronization protocol, but that's one way to, to solve that problem. Um, the other issue is what happens if, uh, if uh, prostaglandin or GnRH is given up front, but then a GnRH is given when you remove the cedar, because at that point you're going to stimulate cows to start to cycle. Uh, to, to turn over follicles before your, your time to artificial insemination. And again, what you do then is you just turn that into the seven and seven protocol, leave the cedar in, and then give prostaglandin seven days after that and time AI and GnRH. So very simple just to shift the protocol by, by one week again. <laughs> very often we get phone calls though uh, where people have called after removing the cedar and realizing that they gave GnRH at the wrong time here rather than prostaglandin. And what we recommend is you still keep the seven day interval here, but if you can at least turn in, uh, turn those cows back in somewhere between my, day minus seven and zero, reinsert the cedar and then pull it out when you give that prostaglandin injection that'll help uh, your pregnancy rates when you give that time AI and GnRH at 60 to 66 hours. So those are fairly simple problems to, uh, to overcome, but sometimes the timing doesn't work out because schedules don't work out and things like that. Um, if you do have issues in which timing is gonna be an, uh, a concern, I would recommend then that you simply email members of the reproduction task force and allow them to try and help you understand uh, where, and try and help you understand how to fix some of those problems. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, use cedars and whether you can reuse cedars and things like that. Uh, Carl Dolan at North Dakota State University and, and I did a project um, that we, we published in 2014 
um, basically taking cedars and trying to sterilize them in multiple different ways uh, in, in how we know people have tried to sterilize cedars to reuse them. Just know that the progesterone in a cedar is embedded in that, um, in that, uh, in, in the cedar. And so whenever you try and heat them up in some way, it draws progesterone back out to the surface of the cedar. And so what we did is we either used uh, um, a new cedar or we used uh, a cedars that have been uh, used but have not been processed in any way. They've just been stored in a dry place or they've been autoclaved. We process some in a dishwasher, a microwave, a toaster oven, clothes dryer, boiling water, and then uh, some cedars we stored outside for two months uh, just to expose them to the ele elements. And when you take a look at the progesterone, the concentrations of progesterone from these cedars, that uh, the progesterone from those cedars that were autoclaved have the highest peak um, compared to anything else to any of these other protocols. The second highest peak shortly, three hours after you uh, put them back into the cow, into the heifers, um, were, were the new cedars. But you can see those new cedars are more sustained and the progesterone lasts longer. And so this isn't a promotion to try and reuse cedars. What, it, what I'm trying to tell you is that there really isn't any great way to mimic a new cedar by reusing those cedars. Certainly autoclaving is going to sterilize them and some of the other heat sterilization is going to um, uh, sterilize them in some way, but the, the concentrations of progesterone in any of those uh, methods of sterilization um, don't have the same progesterone profile. And what's worse is for those folks who, who choose not to do anything with those cedars and leave them outside uh, for 60 days before reusing them. You'll notice that the progesterone is significantly lower in those. And so take home message here is that, you know, you cannot mimic a new cedar. Um, and so um, the cost of pregnancy is so much more valuable than the actual uh, cost of a cedar or reusing a cedar to, to the whole equation of what that's gonna cost you in the end that I recommend that most people utilize a, a new cedar every time because, uh, because that's not gonna have a massive impact on the cost of pregnancy in the end. So let me focus then on um, around the time of artificial insemination, things that need to be focused on there. Obviously it's the AI technique is the most critical thing and semen handling. Those are the two things that really have to be taken into account at that point. I put this in this slide in here just in terms of preparation for AI, making sure that you have everything the day that you go out there to artificially inseminate. It is a checklist of items such as an AI kit, a uh, device to thaw semen uh, with a thermometer that keeps the temperature uh, between 94 and 98 degrees, tweezers, a straw cutter. Those types of things are all really important. And I put the slide here to serve as a checklist to make sure that those are all available and ready. Um, from a semen handling standpoint, it's really important to make sure that um, when, you're, uh, uh, when you um, uncap the, the liquid nitrogen container or the, um, that you um, make sure that you're not getting as much nitrogen to evaporate as possible. So to do it smoothly and slowly, um, basically uh, lift the handle of the uh, um, canister ring, bring it up, but only bring it up um, so that the semen isn't exposed or the, the semen straws are not exposed out. And in my next slide, I'll show you why that's important. Um, the really important thing though, is if you, if you cannot see on the top of the label of the semen, you cannot see the semen that you need, need within the first 10 to 15 seconds, dip it back down into the nitrogen and then bring it back up again. Because if, if you put the semen back in and it bubbles, you know that, you have hold that you've held that semen up too long. Make sure it just uh, goes in without bubbling and, uh, and th that's just a good rule of thumb. And then when you go to remove the semen, make sure that you're reaching into the neck of the, the um, liquid nitrogen tank. Uh, just be very sure that you're doing that rather than bringing the semen up a, 
beyond the actual neck of the semen tank. So this is a picture um, from Dick Sackey showing the temperature gradient in a semen tank from the top down to about six inches into the semen tank. And somewhere around minus 110 degrees Fahrenheit is where sperm um, actually uh, suffers injury. If the temperature rate rises above minus 110, you're going to actually have some uh, damage to the sperm and that cannot be reversed. So you'll notice that somewhere around three inches is as high as you ever want to bring that semen up before you take the semen out to load it into a gun. In terms of preparing the AI syringe, just make sure that you um, uh, remove the straw from the water bath and verify that you have the correct sire. I mean, there's so many times, whether it's embryo transfer or artificial insemination, animals are bred to the wrong bull. And this is the time at which you can make sure that the correct bull is actually uh, being used to inseminate your female. Make sure you dry the semen straw off, cut the straw and seat it into the adapter and make sure it is seated correctly because uh, for those individuals who don't, uh, haven't had a lot of experience with uh, loading guns, um, if it is not seated correctly, sometimes the semen will be deposited, but it'll come back down the inside of the straw rather than being deposited in, in the body of the uterus. So pushing the straw, just push the straw into the sheath, secure the sheath, and then keep the gun warm. Obviously, uh, putting it underneath your shirt or using a, a, a warmer, any of those things will work. Uh, so a lot of questions come is how many straws should we thaw at one time? Well, the, the, the best answer is that you should not thaw um, more than you can use in 10 to 15 minutes. And so, you know, in some operations, um, I was listening to Randall talk earlier, I mean, you can AI um, an animal every 30 seconds if the facilities are great. So you can have as many as 10 or 15 straws being thawed at the same time. But in some operations that we've worked in, what often happens is uh, it takes about five to 10 minutes to get a new female into the chute. Well, in that case, you're only gonna be uh, thawing one or two straws at a time. So know your comfort zone, know what you can do within the facilities and the people that are working with you and your cows in that facility. Uh, when their uh, straws are thawing, don't allow them to touch each other. Make sure that they're separated so that they can get a uniform thaw in the water bath. And one thing that we utilize in large projects is we use multiple thaw baths so that we can continue to uh, keep track of how long the semen is, is being thawed in those thaw baths. Things that are really critical is time. Uh, so making sure you're only thawing um, uh, semen that you can use in the uh, first 10, to, uh, in less than 10 to 15 minutes. Temperature, making sure that that semen is being thawed at 94 to 98 degrees Celsius. Hygiene, uh, things like water, uh, blood, uh, manure, all of those things are detrimental to sperm survival. So keep the hygiene good and then making sure that you have the skill set. And if, you, if those things are good, in general, the res, uh, artificial insemination, the process of artificial insemination is not gonna be the reason that you get poor results. So let me quickly cover some of the things that we talk about in terms of after AI, in terms of uh, embryo survival, making sure that we get good pregnancy rates. And, you know, I think Kai talked a little bit about this, Kai Kohler talked about this last night in terms of uh, embryo survival. In most cases, if a cow has ovulated and we insert semen into a cow using conventional semen, about 95% of the cows will result in a fertilization. So somewhere between 95 and 100% of the cows will be pregnant uh, within a day of artificial insemination at that point. So it's not the fact that we are not necessarily getting cows pregnant, it's are we getting those embryos to survive? And the embryos, uh, they die for multiple different reasons. And so what can we do to reduce the incidence of embryo death so that we get better pregnancy rates to time artificial insemination? So obviously animal handling, stress, nutrition, transport, those are all things that play a role. So, um, I'm just gonna quickly go through this. When you think about survival of the embryos, 
you'll notice here this table. Um, so when a cow comes into estrus on day zero, she's receptive to a bull. Uh, we'll usually AI 12 to 16 hours later um, or, or fixed time to AI at a set time. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to have that semen capacitate and be available to um, ovulate an oocyte when that cow ovulates it around uh, one day after she's in estrus. The period of time from there to about day seven is when the embryo is the most stable. And so this is the period of time, if you're going to stress those animals out in any way, such as transporting them, moving them away, um, whatever it is, if you're going to stress them out, that's very likely when the embryo is going to uh, survive the best. Beyond that, so from around day seven or eight until at least day 28, but uh, we say as long as until day 42, um, anything that you do to stress these animals out, things that they're not used to doing, um, may have a negative impact on embryo survival. And so um, we recommend doing most of those things in terms of moving them from pasture to pasture or taking them to different locations. Do that within the first week of AI. So there are lots of things that have an impact on embryo survival. I mean, heat stress is something, genetic factors. I, I know Kai touched on the uh, asynchrony between the embryo and the maternal environment last night, the effect of the sire. Nutrition is one thing that producers can, uh, can have an impact on. Making sure those animals are in an increasing plane of nutrition approaching the breeding season will have a positive impact on embryo survival. And then we talked about handling and shipping stress. So that uh, brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, I hope that uh, I've sort of tried to tie things together over all of the presentations that have been uh, discussed over the last three days. Um, here is my email address. If, ever, if anyone ever has questions, they're welcome to contact me. Um, and I'll turn it back over to you, Lee.